All right, so uh, welcome again. And in this uh, video, we're going to conclude uh, all the information or review uh, the information in the fluorescence presentation of the, uh, the fourth lecture of the second week. Again, uh, lecture slides by Professor Attila give credit where credit is due. So we're going to go through his presentation. And right now, we are only going to concentrate on FRET. Okay, and I've seen this acronym uh, represented and uh, uh, depicted as fluorescence resonance energy transfer, also first resonance energy transfer. I've also seen it depicted as singlet singlet resonance energy transfer in a question that was asked in a past paper. So all these uh, all these refer to the same the same uh, thing. The same thing is uh, FRET. And I believe that in the lecture slides, it appears as fluorescence resonance energy transfer. In the minimals, it is, uh, what is it, first type uh, resonance energy transfer. So don't be surprised if you see any of these. All these pertain to the same, the same thing, really. So uh, let's take a look at the mechanism. <clears throat> the mechanism of FRET is uh, fairly simple. What we say is that, uh, and we'll go through what we need in order to have FRED, but basically if we have two fluorophores, two molecules that can fluoresce, and, and they're close by, and uh, they have other qualities that we're going to discuss. Let's just say I excite one of these fluorophores. The, this fluorophore can, instead of emitting a photon, can just pass on the energy to its uh, neighbor here its neighboring fluorophore. And that neighboring fluorophore is going to emit the photon. So basically, I'm transferring my fluorescence energy. That means that if we have, <coughs> let's just say I have this fluorescent molecule and this fluorescent molecule, if I excite this fluorescent molecule, I will see emission only from its neighbor. And there's obviously slightly more, uh, more uh, complex uh, interactions going on, but we're only going to review what they asked us to, to know in the uh, presentation and also, and also what they ask about in the material. So basically in, uh, in FRET, what we have is energy transfer from the donor molecule to the acceptor, the acceptor molecule. This is basically what's happening, and it enables us essentially to throw a photon at one molecule and receive a photon from the other molecule. If you'd like to see it, uh, you, can, you can look at it like that. This is basically the inner workings, the mechanism of FRET. And let's uh, take a look at what's required for, th for FRET. Basically, there are three requirements for FRET, and this is uh, in one of the minimals. The first requirement is it's strongly distant dependent. Strong, strongly distance dependent. That means that if, if I have two molecules that are in a set distance, this is the set distance I need for FET, and they're slightly further apart than that, we're not going to have fluorescence resonance energy transfer. Okay, so strongly distance dependent, it is 2 to 10 in the nanometer scale, 2 to 10 nanometers, not a great distance if you think about it. It is strongly distance dependent. And by strongly distance dependent, I also mean that if we have, let's just say this is the required uh, distance for fluorescence resonance energy transfer, and I have two molecules that are in this distance from one another, one is here, one is here, the further this guy gets away, the, the greater the uh, frets uh, will decrease. And this is actually, let's just breeze through the graph that we have here. This is a graph describing, this, I don't have it copied into my presentation, but this graph shows, uh, let's just say I have, it's called the uh, fret efficiency on the y-axis. And you can see that the further we are, the further we are, the further the distance is between the donor and the acceptor, it at some point dramatically decreases. So you may still be within the two, 2 to 10 nanometer um, length or distance, and you can still have fret, but it dramatically decreases as, uh, as you get further apart. 
and I believe they uh, they say that the uh, threat efficiency is inversely proportional to the uh, sixth power of the uh, distance. And you know what? I'm just going to go to the minimal here. Um, proportional to the inverse sixth power, as Tancredi said. Proportional to the inverse sixth power of the separation. Oh yeah, I was correct between the donor and the acceptor. This basically means that it's strongly distance dependent, or you can say inverse sixth power uh, to the distance between them. That is the relationship. So it's strongly distance dependent. This is all you really need to know. Also, what you need to have, other than uh, the uh, distance dependency here, is overlapping spectra which means that the donor emission spectrum needs to overlap with the acceptor absorption absorption oh, this just went to hell absorption spectrum when you think about it, if you think about it for a second, it kind of makes sense. This acceptor needs to accept energy from the donor. And it can only accept when it, within its absorption spectrum. And the donor needs to transfer energy to the acceptor, and it can only transfer within its emission spectrum. So it makes sense that these two need to overlap. And let me show you how it looks. This is taken from the uh, lecture slide. We have two emission and two absorption spectrum. And obviously, <clears throat> this is the, uh, this is the uh, absorption spectrum of the uh, donor. And this is the, ab the absorption spectrum of the um, acceptor. Now, what we need is an overlap between the emission spectrum of the donor, which is anything below this line here, anything below this line here, and the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. And we know that we have it just by looking at this graph. <coughs> we have it here. This is all of this. All of this is an area that is both within the uh, absorption spectrum of the acceptor and the emission spectrum of the donor. So we have that. In this instance, we have it. So it's, it's quite intuitive to understand that it's one of the necessities just because we understand the inner ideas and the basic ideas of fluorescence. And the next thing we have is just proper orientation. Proper orientation. And you can think about it in, in a very, in a very um, oversimplified way is if this is a fluorophore and this is a fluorophore, they need to be at a certain orientation to be able to fret. You can think about it this way. This is just an easy way um, that I like to think about it. You need to have proper orientation. And this is also in the minimals. Let's take a look at it. Where we, there you go. What are the requirements for uh, first uh, type resonance energy transfer? Separation between the donor and the acceptor has to be in the range of 2 to 10 nanometers. There has to be an overlap between the emission spectrum of the donor and the excitation or absorption spectrum of the acceptor. And the relative orientations of the donor and acceptor have to be adequate. That means that you ha need to have proper orientation, which is, uh, which is acceptable to us. So this is the requirements of FRET. Implications. <clears throat> what do I mean by implications? What I mean is that I have, I have my donor and I have my acceptor. And the question is, how does FRET affect them as far as different parameters we looked at? Let's take a look at excited lifetime. Excited lifetime. Now we need to we need to keep in mind whenever we're looking at these parameters. I'm just going to toss all of them here. Uh, uh, let's say fluorescence intensity, blue fluorescence intensity, and let's take a look at the rate of photo bleaching. Rate of photo bleaching. And if you're asked about this, the easiest way to answer this, what happens, is just imagine the energy that we give to the donor, the donor would just relay to the acceptor.
which means that it's not going to be affected as much by this energy. It's not going to have as much energy. So let's take a look at this. Excited lifetime. If the donor has less energy, the energy goes to the acceptor, the donor molecule is going to be less time in the excited state than the acceptor molecule. So you can imagine that the excited lifetime for the donor would go down, while the excited lifetime for the acceptor would go up. Again, that's because <clears throat> the donor, instead of using that energy and get, getting excited, just relays it, and then the acceptor is going to be excited. Let's take a look at fluorescence intensity. <clears throat> and for the same reason, fluorescence intensity, the donor is going to be less likely to fluoresce. It may fluoresce a little bit, may emit a little bit of photons, but the majority of the photons are going to be emitted by the acceptor because it got most of the energy. So in effect, fluorescence intensity for the donor, for the same reason, is going to be decreased, while the fluorescence intensity for the acceptor is going to be increased. Let's take a look at rate of photobleaching. And we said that photobleaching occurs when you have high intensity or uh, a specific intensity into a, in a long duration of energy <coughs> transferred. So let's see, if I have a super, super high intensity photobleaching light on the donor, shown on the donor here, uh, we know that the donor just takes this energy basically and just relays it to the acceptor. So the donor is not really, is not really as, as prone to being damaged by, by this uh, emission as much as the acceptor is because it just relays the energy. So the rate of photobleaching, if any, for the donor is going to decrease because the donor is not going to be as likely or as likely to be to being photobleached as much as the acceptor because just think of all these guys, all of these guys here are just going to be transfer to the acceptor. See? So the acceptor is going to have to deal with all that uh, insane amount of energy. So the rate of photobleaching for the acceptor is going to be increased. And really when you're thinking about these parameters, if you have a true or false question, a relation analysis question, da 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 da, what you really need to think is that this energy is just going from the donor to the acceptor. And that's pretty much what's going on and that is the implication for any of these. Hopefully this makes a little bit of sense. Now, as far as applications, we have, as far as applications, and again, we're just going through material. This is not teaching you all about the wonders of FRET. This is just preparing you for basics of the biophysics course. And basically, we're always bearing the exams in mind, okay? So what we need to think about is what sort of applications may they or might they ask about or would they want us to know? So first of all, we need to know that it's good for measuring protein-protein interactions. Interactions. One reason for that is that there, was, there were a few exams in which the question was, uh, the true or false question was, uh, Fred is good for measuring protein-protein interactions. And the answer was, of course, true. Also, what you need to bear in mind is that be in the lecture slides, right here, the lecture slides, uh, da, da, da. powerful method for looking at molecule association, protein-protein interaction, recept receptor line gate interactions. And when you think about it, receptor line gate interactions, molecule association, they're all protein-protein interactions. So protein-protein interaction is a vast, vast uh, category. The next thing you need to think about is in the minimals, it says this, Forrester type resonance energy transfer, a sensitive method for distance measurements. So we can just add this up, um, sensitive method for distance measurements. Now, uh, the biophysics department at Denverton does use FRET and research. So they do like to ask questions about it. I haven't seen it in an open essay question, but often you would see it as relation analysis, as uh, true or false. And when you think about it, FRET is not that difficult to understand when you think about the sim simplified ideas that we presented here. 
although that if you take a look at the material itself, it may seem very overwhelming, very, very, very overwhelming. So when you think about it, just simplify. There's a mechanism, certain requirements. There are three of them. There's a few implications, and there's a few applications, a couple that you need to know. And it's a simple uh, topic, and it's just uh, easy to get points on that. So uh, hopefully you found this helpful. And we've sealed the fluorescence uh, lecture, and we'll see you in the next one.